This morning we are going to uh, hear the passage from Acts chapter 9, verses 32 through 43. I want to invite you to open a Bible if you have one on a device or a, a paper Bible with you, a, uh, or you can use the one that's in the, uh, the pew there, the, the chairs, a worship Bible. That's page 918. I want to invite you to stand in honor of God's word as we open to Acts chapter 9, verse 32 to the end of the chapter as I read it for us here together. Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 32. Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. And there he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas or gazelle. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. Sounds like it's kind of too late, actually. I do not know how they, they thought this. Please come without delay. So Peter rose and went with them, and he, when he arrived, they took him into the upper room. All the, windows stood beside, all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is like a two-edged sword, piercing and dividing the spirit and uh, speaking to us your truth. Thank you that it is inspired and trustworthy, and it is a historical account of all that happened here with Peter. Lord, we pray that as we open this, your word and uh, reflect on it this morning, that you would increase our faith and help us to practice what it is you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, we've been going through the book of Acts since about January, and uh, we learned at the beginning of the book of Acts that Jesus said to his disciples and apostles that they should wait in Jerusalem because they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. And when they received that power, they would be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. And uh, we've been following this story through the book of Acts so far, this uh, almost a tour de force that Luke is giving us as we see the gospel just explode onto the scene. And uh, a, a number of really significant developments have happened since Pentecost. That was Acts chapter 2. Peter and John had uh, healed a lame man there by the temple and gotten in harm's way from the priests and the people who were very upset about this that were the Jewish leaders. Uh, we saw the church was growing by leaps and bounds. We saw people giving very generously to the work and remaining in fellowship and under the apostles' teaching. And uh, then we saw the, uh, um, the deacons be appointed. And two of the deacons, Philip and Stephen, were both very mighty men in word and in deed. And they spoke to the people and had tremendous evangelism opportunities. And then in the last two weeks, we've seen that Saul, the one who was persecuting, that drove them out into the, the places outside of Jerusalem, himself became a Christian. And uh, you can just see God is setting up the story for the gospel to just explode by going beyond the Jews and the Hellenist Jews now to the Gentiles. And that's going to happen next chapter. And here at the end of chapter 9, Luke is giving us a snapshot of Peter's ongoing ministry among all of this ministry that's been happening in the early church. And specifically, Luke tells us of these two accounts of healing power that, God, that Jesus did through Peter. What I want to look at them today uh, briefly, as we look at, I think Luke's thesis is simply this, that uh, Peter is an effective agent of God's grace that the Holy Spirit is using to continue to preach, heal, and evangelize. And what we see from these healings here are four things in common between these two healings. And they are as follows. 
Number one, these two healings mirror the ministry of Jesus. They have uh, a lot of echoes from earlier in the Gospel of Luke that Luke recorded of Jesus healing people in particular. Secondly, they are performed by the power of Jesus, not by Peter's power, but by the power of Jesus. Thirdly, they are signs of the salvation of Jesus. And fourthly, they produce faith in Jesus. So we don't have a lot of time this morning, but I want to walk through those four points briefly with you as we look at this. The first point is this, that these two healings mirror the ministry of Jesus. If you're familiar with the Gospels, some of these stories might seem like deja vu to you. Do you remember the story where Jesus uh, goes and heals uh, the man who is led in through the roof? There's that story, right, where Jesus is preaching to the crowds, and uh, they're all in there, and they're packed in this house, and some friends want to bring this man on a mat to Jesus. And they get up to the, the house, and it's just crammed with people, and they can't make their way in. So they come up with a very creative solution. They go up on that flat roof, they open up the tiles, and they let their friend down through the roof, down to the floor, right in front of Jesus, and interrupt his teaching and everything. And uh, there's a big confrontation there between Jesus and the religious leaders. But the interesting moment that comes is when Jesus speaks to the man, the paralytic, and says, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And here we have this echo of this in Peter, saying the same thing to this man who is paralyzed for eight years. He says these words, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he arose. So you see the parallel right there. It's like almost unmistakably so similar. And Luke, the author that records both of these accounts, I think wants us to see the connection between Jesus and Peter. And the connection is this, that Peter is mirroring, he's doing what he was taught by Jesus to do. What Jesus modeled and exemplified and what Jesus gave to Peter as a role as an apostle and a sign as an apostle. Uh, the other passage that happens is that Jesus also healed a little girl. And in similar form, what had happened was this man, Jairus, had a daughter who was ill. And some messengers came to Jesus from Jairus. And uh, Jesus actually doesn't get there until she's already passed away. And so an additional messengers came by and said, Master, it's okay. She already passed. Too late for the healing. But Jesus goes anyways, and he goes to this little girl, and her name is Talitha. Now, in the story here, it's Tabitha. In the story there, it's Talitha, or Talitha, if you want to do a parallel so they rhyme, right? And so here, we have these two people healed, both with these words, Talitha, arise. Tabitha, arise. So there's this clear echo that Luke is informing us of. These miracles mirror the ministry of Jesus. In fact, that's how uh, Luke describes the, uh, the work of the book of Acts. Is these are all the things that Jesus continued to do after he'd been taken up into heaven. Do you realize that the, the ministry of Jesus continues in the New Testament era once Jesus has ascended to the right hand of the Father, now through his disciples whom he trained? That's what's happening here in the book of Acts. The second thing that these double miracles show us is that they are performed by the power of Jesus, not by Peter. That's why when he speaks to Aeneas, he says to Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Peter is always very clear about this. It's not him who is the healer, it is Jesus. Amen? And uh, so we see that Jesus is the one who heals. And uh, Jesus does this for a number of reasons. Number one, I think we see that Jesus does it because he loves people. He loves Tabitha. And he loves Tabitha's friends. You can almost kind of get the picture there where uh, Peter has arrived and there's all these widows and they've been loved by Tabitha and they've got their tunics and they're like, look what she made for me. This is so precious. She loved me. She cared for me and now she's gone and I'm so sad. And when Peter brings her back to life, uh, we see that they are obviously comforted, aren't they? The other reason why Jesus brings healings is for his own renown. Jesus wants to make himself known. He wants his kingdom to advance. And so at times he does perform supernatural healings either immediately or through other people so that other people will hear that and be brought to faith. And that is clearly the result of what happens here in this passage. Uh, the display of his power results in testimony of Jesus. Uh, these are therefore the results that we see. If we look there back at our text uh, verse 35 says this, All the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, that is the man who was healed, Aeneas, and they turned to the Lord. 
And then also, after Dorcas is healed, Peter shows her, presents her alive. And we read in verses 42 and 43, And this became known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. So we see that the result of these healings is not so much only for the healing in and of itself, though that is a good thing, but there's a secondary thing that God is doing through this healing to bring about faith in Jesus. The third thing that we see in common here is that these double healings are signs of the salvation of Jesus. Think about rising Aeneas from paralysis, right? Uh, in our sinful condition, before Christ comes and raises us into new life in him, we are like that paralytic spiritually. We lack the ability to get up. But the risen Christ brings rising power to our hearts to give us faith and brings us from death to life. Even more so, we see this with Tabitha, don't we? She's actually already dead. They have cleaned her body and they have her in, our, in an upper room and they're postponing the funeral, hoping that Peter can help. And this is clearly symbolic of the supernatural work of faith in grace in Jesus Christ, right? Here she's dead and now she's alive. Paul will say in Ephesians chapter 1, we were dead in our transgressions and sins, but God made us alive together in Christ. Now, I just want to take a brief caveat, and you might be asking this question. Okay, Pastor Tim, uh, we've read this story. Here Peter does some amazing healings, and they're immediate and supernatural. And we've heard from our friend Vijay this morning about some supernatural things that God did to bring miraculous healing in his life. Are we supposed to expect miracles today? What should be our posture about miracles? Well, I want to kind of thread the needle by talking about two errors that can happen. One error is we say that miracles must happen if we have the right faith. This is clearly wrong, right? Uh, what happens is people get careened on the side and they, maybe healing doesn't come in their life and they think that they were a failure. Or they blame themselves or they blame God. You see, God is not a vending machine. We don't just insert the coin of faith and receive the vending at the bottom. God is not that way. God chooses to heal in specific places and times for his purposes. And so miracles are not mandatory. We can't pull them out of heaven. The other error, though, of course, is to say miracles never happen, right? I mean, it's clear that we just heard from Vijay that some miraculous things happened in his life. We'll share the blog link with you later. If you'd like to go read that, we'll share that in our email this week with you. And, um, you know, clearly miracles do happen. Because the, the other error is that we just get cynical, right? We say, well, they never happen. I won't even ask for one. I won't get my hopes up this time. Of course, this is kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You know, if you don't ask, you're not, not going to have. That's, even Jesus says that. You don't ask, you don't have because you don't ask. There's nothing for God to answer. Uh, the middle path, though, is that God sometimes heals people in answer to prayer. And we can and should have faith to pray and ask for God's healing. Now, of course, some of these miracles that we see Peter do are apostolic-level miracles, aren't they? I mean, raising dead people is not common. Am I right? I have heard other stories occasionally in other places that these kind of miracles have happened in places where the gospel is very much needed. But this is a sign that follows apostolic authority and leadership straight from Jesus. But there's nothing to say, nothing in the Bible that says that miracles have officially ceased either. Where are we then? Well, we're in the, what we call the already, the not yet. We are already in the kingdom age, but not in the kingdom era. We're not, the kingdom fulfillment has not yet come. So what are, what are healings? Healings are in-breakings of the ultimate kingdom into this age right now, the age of the Spirit. And they do happen, but we can't always count on them, but we can believe that God has the power to do it. Ultimately, God will heal everyone when he returns, when Jesus comes back and renews all things. Amen? This is Revelation chapter 2, verse 3, 21, verse 3. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. That means no, wick, and no um, illness or disease either. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So I encourage you to pray in faith, 
in anticipation, but not with presumption. That's the best I can do as your pastor to try to say this clearly. So we've seen these three things out of four so far. We've seen this, that the uh, miracles of Peter mirror the ministry of Jesus. The miracles of Peter are performed by the power of Jesus. Jesus Christ heals Aeneas. And that they are signs of the salvation of Jesus and the ultimate salvation that he will bring. And lastly, that they produce faith in Jesus, something I alluded to already, that all those who lived in Lydda and Sharon turned to the Lord. And that when Tabitha was restored to life, this became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. John Stott's faithful commentary says this, In accordance with the purpose of the signs, which was to authenticate and illustrate the salvation message of the apostles, people heard the word, saw the sign, and believed. As we continue in the book of Acts, let's anticipate that God wants to do great things. Let's lean in. Let's trust him and see where he leads us as we seek his power in our lives, which he promises by his spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It is faithful and true and directs us and guides our paths. We thank you for the amazing account of Peter through whom you used for the healing both Aeneas and Dorcas. We thank you that their lives and the lives of others were transformed by your uh, eschatological intervention into the age of the Spirit. We thank you that you are continually intervening at places and times that suit your goodwill, your providence, and advance the kingdom that others would come to faith in Jesus. Lord, we know that uh, even when we don't always know that we can be healed physically, we know that the promise of the gospel means that we can always be healed spiritually. That that promise is always available and that those physical healings actually point us toward the spiritual healing that is available to us today. We thank you, Lord, that you are present to heal us both spiritually and physically and that you want to do good in our lives. Help us to trust you fully. Help us to grow in faith. And we pray that we would see breakthroughs of your kingdom power even among us for your good and for the advancement of your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.